There are copies of the handout for today outside. Uh, hopefully you should all have one. And uh, if we ran out, please make sure you sit next to somebody who has a copy. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, if you click on a box on the page that you're viewing, the uh, sources have been uh, uploaded onto the site and you can uh, look at it as I proceed and you can also uh, print them out if you would like. As I begin every year, Poschen Bechvod Achsanya, we have a double Achsanya, the first Achsanya, the virtual Achsanya, and uh, my own presence here is under the auspices of Yeshiva University and uh, multiple Hakara Satovs, to President Joel, to Rabbi Brander, and the other vice presidents uh, of our yeshiva. And in particular for today's uh, presentation, we thank Rabbi Rob Shore for all of the effort that he expended to make sure that this works. Menachem Lewin, and also a debt of gratitude to Rabbi Yaakov Glasser, who's the Dean of the Center for the Jewish Future, under which, under the auspices of which this uh, webcast and this presentation is taking place. I also want to express uh, Hakar Satov to the Rockoffs uh, from Boston for sponsoring the uh, webcast telecast of this presentation. We also have a physical achsanya, a congregation Keter Torah every year. It's my, I think, 11th year that I've been here teaching on Tisha B'Av in this uh, shul and in this spot. To acknowledge uh, the Marda Asra, Rabbi Baum, the lay leadership of the shul, Howie Grunschbach, the executive director who worked so hard together with Rabbi Shore to put together today's program. And we thank the Fine Talks <coughs> and the Pauls for their sponsorship. We also want to add uh, this particular year that uh, from my perspective, in addition to those whose names I've mentioned, uh, I want to dedicate uh, the learning as well to my rabbi for a Rafua Shalema. Uh, I uh, have the privilege of davening in Congregation Rinat Yisrael, which is very close to here. And uh, I have the extraordinary honor of having an extraordinary rabbi. Um, all of us who daven in Rinat appreciate the greatness of our rabbi, as I'm sure all of you who daven in Keter Torah appreciate the greatness of your rabbi. Our rabbi is not well. Rabbi Yosef Adler, he's uh, engaged in a struggle for his health. We are very concerned. Uh, we have in uh, our shul put together a whole <coughs> learning program in the Zchus for him for Rafua Shalema. And uh, I would like to dedicate uh, today's learning, my, my piece of today's learning, in addition to Mori Varabi Harav Yosef Ze'ev Ben Sprinza that he should have a Rafua Shalema. And in conclusion, I want to invoke the name and uh, maybe even the presence of Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik. Uh, today, it's quite uh, mekubal that uh, there are a number of uh, programs uh, devoted to the study of Kinos and the themes of Tisha B'Av, leading up to Tisha B'Av and on Tisha B'Av, their multiplicity of shiurim and classes and webcasts that uh, we can access. But all of that, all of that uh, is because of the pioneering work that was done by Rabbi Soloveitchik. We think often of his contribution in so many different areas, but I think every Tisha B'Av, it's important to highlight that he was the one who created Tisha B'Av as a meaningful day. Uh, until he devoted attention to Tisha B'Av, the Sefer HaKinos was the Sefer HaChosom. 
It was a closed book. It was difficult poetry. It was complicated. Uh, people sat on the floor, didn't really understand it, didn't know what they were doing um, on the whole. And uh, he opened it up for us. Um, I had the privilege in the 70s when I was living in the Boston area uh, to spend time uh, l l learning from him and listening to him. And uh, just recently I was musing and trying to imagine if he had the same technological possibilities that I have now. So uh, there are many people who are here, there are many more people who are watching this online. So could you imagine if Rabbi Soloveitchik was teaching the Kinos and we had the capacity of accessing it from wherever we were all over the world? When he taught it, he taught it in the Maimonides School and there were maybe uh, 70, 80, 90 people who were sitting there, um, spilled out from the, the old base medrash in Maimonides School into the auditorium. But that was it. It was just limited to those who were physically present. So I'm imagining hundreds of thousands of people who uh, would have that opportunity. And uh, even though he didn't have that opportunity, but what he instituted uh, remains in place. And uh, all of us, everybody who's involved in this effort, uh, recognize and appreciate what it was and what it is that he uh, was able to accomplish. The issue that I want to deal with this year is the significance of the 10th of Av. And I want to begin in a way that I generally begin, and that is to just acknowledge how difficult Tisha B'Av is. If you turn to the first entry on the first page, Reb Shlomo Volben, the Ali Shur, Chelek Beis, has a whole section. It's a famous, famous Mashgiach in Ber Yaakov, and then he was a Mashgiach in the Mir. He uh, has a whole chapter on uh, one of the keynotes of uh, Rabbi Lezer Akhalir that uh, we're going to get to at some point later this afternoon. But he introduces it in a way that I thought would be appropriate to introduce our learning. No da'al ha'emes. Let's, uh, let's fess up. Let's admit uh, the truth. Beis ha'mikdosh v'churbano rachok me'itono ad ma'ot. The Beis ha'mikdosh the existence of the Beis HaMikdosh and the destruction and the non-existence of the Beis HaMikdosh is very far from us. Dai tov lanu ba'olam kefi shahu b'li Beis HaMikdosh. You know, it's gone fine, everything is fine, we're doing pretty well. It's okay without the Beis HaMikdosh. Ve'inenu margishim ki ha'ikar chaser ba'olam we don't recognize that the most fundamental aspect of the existence of the world and certainly of the Jewish people is missing from the time that God left his presence on this earth and went up to the heavens. So he's being magdir. We've seen this in the past, and we'll come back to it, that the key implication, the key tragedy of the Chorben Beis Hamikdash is histalko sashchina, that the the imminence of God's presence is no longer palpable and God's presence now moved to a higher place and we find ourselves bereft, uh, flailing in the absence of the palpable immediate presence of God. And we don't uh, realize that really. We don't acknowledge that. We're not in touch with that. It's day to day, everything is wonderful. In order to be able to bring us close to appreciate this and to understand it, it's important for us to elaborate. And he proceeds to elaborate on a particular kina. And uh, what I would like to do today, as I've done for many, many years, is to elaborate in order to at least somewhere, maybe I'll say something, that will inspire myself and maybe some of you to reflect a little bit on the implications of the lack of a Beis HaMikdash. So the specific focus is the, uh, is the 10th of Av. So today's the 10th of Av. So Tisha B'Av this year is not on Tisha B'Av. 
Tisha B'Av this year is on Asir B'Av. Now, if you try to analyze the significance of the fact that Tisha B'Av is today, on the 10th of Av, Vasep is on the 10th of Av. So the most obvious explanation is that it's what we call a Nidche. A Nidche means it was uh, supposed to be yesterday, the 9th of Av should be on the 9th of Av, but it couldn't be yesterday because yesterday was Shabbos, and so we push it off until today. The uh, Mishnah says, uh, in the, the second Mishnah in Megillah, at the bottom of the first page, is a continuation of the first Mishnah in Megillah and Daf Beis Aleph. The Mishnah in Masachas Megillah begins with the fact that the Megillah on, around the time of Purim could be read on multiple days. It could be read on the 11th of Adar, the 12th of Adar, the 13th of Adar, the 14th of Adar, the 15th of Adar. There's a, there's a, a range of days on which this uh, mitzvah could be fulfilled. And the Mishnah goes through the whole Cheshbon and basically says that there are circumstances when it falls during the week, not on a Monday and a Thursday, where we go back and we read it the previous Monday or Thursday. And that's called Yom HaKnisa. Yom HaKnisa is the time when people are gathered together. So the Mishnah says if you're living in a small town, the assumption is you don't really have an expert in that small village or town or hamlet who knows how to read the Megillah. So they can go to a larger city on Monday and Thursday. They're probably going anyway into the big city on a Monday or Thursday, Rashi says, because it's the time of the Bezdin meets on Monday and Thursday. Monday and Thursday is Yom Akni, so it's market day, and that's probably why the Bezdin meets on Monday and Thursday, because everybody gathers to sell their wares on Monday and Thursday. So if it falls on a Tuesday, you go back to the Monday. If it falls on a Wednesday, you can go back to the Monday. So the Mishnah has a whole chesim, a long Mishnah that goes day of the week by day of the week to outline and uh, conclude that when it comes to Megillah, if you can't read it or it's not comfortable to read it or it's not realistic that it's going to be read on the day that it should be read, namely the 14th, if it's uh, not a walled city. So then you can go earlier. At which point picks up uh, our Mishnah now on Daf Heya Medbeis. A Hamid Aleph in Masachis Megillah at the bottom of page one. The end of the second line in the Mishnah, Be'elu Omru Makdimim Velo Ma'achrin, when it comes to Megillah, as we have just concluded in the first Mishnah, when it comes to this reality, we go earlier and we don't go later. In other words, if uh, the 14th falls on a Tuesday, we don't say, well, we're going to wait till Thursday, or if it falls on a Wednesday, we don't say that we're going to wait. To, for the next day, we actually go back two days to Monday if it falls on a Wednesday. So when it comes to this category, if we can't do it when we should do it, we go earlier. Avol, however, there are a number of other categories when the principle is the opposite, where if you can't do it on the day that you should do it, you don't go back, you don't anticipate it earlier, but rather you postpone it. And one of them is Aval, the second one is Tishabov. When it comes to Tishabov, Ma'achrin Velo Magdime. We push it off and we don't go later. So look at Rashi, Be'elu Amru. Bismanim Shel Megillah Amru, Magdimim. His example is Mchal Yadalad Bishabbos, because that's the parallel example to Tishabov. If the 14th falls on Shabbos, you go and you read it on the previous Thursday. Aval, but with regard to this list, one of which is Tishabov, we don't go back, we push it, we push it forward. And uh, says Rashi, in the middle of Rashi, when he gets to Vechein Tishabov, Shechalios B'Shabbos, when uh, Tishabov falls on a Shabbos, we push it off to Sunday, we don't push it off, we don't uh, do it earlier. Says Rashi, and this is something that I hope we'll get to in the course of the day, it's not only if Tisha B'Av falls on Shabbos, you do it on Sunday, but if Shavas B'Tamuz falls on Shabbos, you do it on Sunday, right? Guess what? It wasn't that long ago, exactly three weeks ago, when we had the same experience. You understand very well that if Tisha B'Av falls on Shabbos, so Shavas B'Tamuz is going to fall on Shabbos, and we observed Shavas B'Tamuz on Sunday, on the 18th. So it's not just the din in Tisha B'Av, says Rashi, even though the Mishnah identifies it as Tisha B'av, but it's V'hu Adin, also the other fast days, Tisha B'av and the Asar B'teves. Just file that away, we're gonna come back to this. 
that if Asar Beteves falls on Shabbos, Shitas Rashi is, that we should do it on Sunday. So Asar Beteves can't fall on Shabbos, according to the uh, vagaries, or not vagaries, according to the, the system of our calendar, it can't fall on Shabbos, but Lu Yitzuyer, if Asar Beteves could fall on Shabbos, Rashi includes that among the list of those fast days that would be pushed off until Sunday. There's a Gemara in Rosh Hashanah Yod Chesam at Beis that we will get to at some point with the Gemara there based on the Mishnah. The Mishnah says that for six months of the year um, messengers would be sent from the Bez and Agodol and Yerushalayim to inform everybody when Rosh Chodesh uh, was uh, designated. It's in the uh, section of Rosh Hashanah that talks about Kiddush HaChodesh and there's a whole procedure, and the witnesses come, and they testify, they saw the little sliver, and they give them a grilling to make sure that they're uh, 100% correct. And then uh, once they, Mekudosh HaChodesh, they determine that today is Rosh Chodesh, they send for six months, they send out um, notice to the uh, far-flung communities that everybody should know when Rosh Chodesh was. And for the six months, they're all significant because there's something important that's gonna be happening in the course of that month that we should know whether we should do it today or we should do it tomorrow or whether we should do it today or do it yesterday, we, we have to know exactly when to do it. And the Mishnah says, Val'av atainis, and one of them is Chodesh Av. So the Gemara asks, Vaseb, it's only Chodesh Av. What about the other Taniyos? <coughs> we have to know in uh, Tammuz, we have to know when to fast, for example, on Shavas of Tammuz. So the Gemara goes through a whole discussion and basically the Gemara concludes that with other Taniyos technically depending on what the status of the reality of the experience that is going on for the Jewish people at that time, other fast days, Ratzu Misana and Ratzu Misana, and essentially they're optional under certain historical reality ex- uh, experiences or circumstances. But Tisha B'Av is Huch Belu Botsaros. Tisha B'Av is a, is, is a double. And what's a double? That both uh, Batei Mikdash were destroyed on Tisha B'Av and therefore it has a Chumra that it's never optional, but it's something that's required. So Rashi here in Megillah says that because Tisha B'Av has a Chumrah that the other fast days don't have, so therefore the Mishnah here singles out Tisha B'Av, but you should know that it's not only limited to Tisha B'Av when it comes three weeks ago, Tisha B'Av B'Tamuz, or, again, please remember, Asar B'Teves, we also do it on Sunday. The reason is because we're not Makdim Peronios. We don't want to have... Um, punishments earlier, so therefore if we're going to do something that's going to commemorate a punishment, we're going to do it later. So therefore today, the reason why we have uh, Tisha B'Av today, the reason why we're having the uh, Nihuge Avelos of Tisha B'Av today is because Sebeferish Mishnah Megillah Daf Hey, that uh, we are uh, Ma'acher, we're Ma'acher, we're not Makdim, because we can't do it on Shabbos. And it's quoted Lahalach in the Shulchan Aruch at the top of page 2, Shulchan Aruch and Simen Tov Kuf Nun in Orachayim. Shulchan Aruch talks about the four fast days. The four fast days in the Pasuk in Zechariah, Tzom HaRavi, Vitzom HaChamishi, Vitzom HaShvi, Vitzom HaAsiri. The fast of the fourth is the fast of the fourth month, which is Tammuz, which is Shavas of Tammuz. Vitzom HaChamishi, the fast of the fifth, which is the uh, fifth month, which is Tishba, Vitzom HaShvi is Tzom Gedalia. And some are serious as Sarbateves, so the Mishnah, the Pasik in Zechariah mentions all four of them. So they're all a unit. That's actually the basis of the question of the Gemara and Rosh Hashanah. Why only on Tishabav do we send out the Shluchim? Tishabav is only one of four. There's a Beferish Pasik that does not single out Tishabav, that includes Tishabav in the category of all four. So all four of them are mentioned. They're all four considered to be a unit. So the uh, Shulchan Aruch talks about these four Ta'anios, and then in Tav Kuf Nun Se'if Gimel, top of page two, Kol Dalot Somos Halolu, Em Cholo Lios B'Shabbos, Nidchin La'achar Shabbos. So it's a, it's a Nidcha. So today is very clearly uh, understood as, oh gee, I'm really sorry, it should have been yesterday, but it can't be yesterday, so we do it today. Now, in the, in the category of Nidche, there is uh, a very famous Chakira 
that is uh, developed among many achronim. Uh, Avnei Nezer is one of them, but not limited. The Chakir is as follows. When we say that Tisha B'Av Zenitcha, what does that mean? Does it mean that Be'etzim it really should have been yesterday, but it couldn't be yesterday, so we do it today? Or does it mean that Me'ikar Adin, if it, they can't, if it falls on Shabbos, it can't be Shabbos? So Me'ikar Adin, it's today. Is today simply because it couldn't be yesterday, and therefore it has no independent identity. It's only a push off from yesterday. Or do we say that if it can't be on Shabbos, so then today is the originally established day when it should be. So there are a number of nafkaminas. The, the achronim develop a whole bunch of nafkaminas. For example, let's say somebody became a bar mitzvah boy today or bar mitzvah girl today on the 10th of Av. So are they chayev or are they not chayev, technically speaking? Forget chinuch for a moment. Are they chayev or are they not chayev? So if you say that the only reason why we're doing it today is because we couldn't do it yesterday in Be'etz and we should have done it yesterday, but yesterday he was not a bar chayuva. He was not a bar chayuva yesterday. So if today is only because we couldn't do it yesterday, it's an extension of yesterday. So if yesterday is not a bar chayuva, so he shouldn't be chayev today. However, if you say that Me'ikar Adin, today is the day that's Nikba, today is Me'ikara Nikba as the day of Tisha B'av, as the day of fasting, so he's Chayev today because she's Chayev is today because today is today. Today they're obligated. Uh, is there a Shavuot Shechalbo if Tisha B'av under these circumstances? A big discussion. Uh, I saw there's a lot of comment this year in particular. Is there a Shavuot Shechalbo? So if you say that it's on Shabbos, that the Etzim is really Shabbos, so they have a shvur shachalbo. But if you say meikar adin, it's Sunday. So maybe, maybe, there's a tzad to say, big discussion. There, there is no shvur When's the shvur shachalbo? The shvur begins Matsai Shabbos, and boom, it's already the fast. So does that obligate me last week? Last week is not shvur shachalbo. If meikar adin, it's as if Tisha B'av falls on a Sunday. If Tisha B'av falls on a Sunday, is there a shvur shachalbo or not? Another nafkamina, there, there are multiple nafkaminas. Uh, Avela Shebetzina, yesterday. So should there be Avela Shebetzina, a personal uh, relationship between husband and wife? Is there an inyan of Avela Shebetzina yesterday? So the achronim say, it's also totally on this chakira. If Be'etzim, it should have been yesterday, but I can't do it because it's Shabbos, but Be'etzim, that's when the day is. So there should be Avela Shebetzina. I know it's Shabbos, so we don't do Avela Shebetzina. But maybe Avela Shebetzina, we should do. But if you say that Meikar Adin, yesterday is irrelevant to this. Yesterday is nothing to this. In a year when it falls on Shabbos, then Shabbos is irrelevant, the ninth is irrelevant, and everything is on the tenth. So maybe there is no issue of Avela Shebetzina on Shabbos because there's, there's nothing going on. Today is really Meikar Adin today. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought a lot about this. Uh, one year, this is not the first time that uh, Tisha B'Av is, uh, is a nitcha. We've had it a number of times. I don't know exactly in the last, I don't know, number of years. We've had this a number of times. And a couple of years ago, I prepared for my shear for, for uh, the morning. Uh, I prepared uh, a whole analysis of this uh, subject. And the first part went so long that I ended up not addressing it all. So I figured this year... I'm good to go. I have a whole shear that I already prepared that I never gave. But then I began to think about the other aspect of the Tent of Av, and that's really what uh, got my attention, and that's what I want to devote uh, my uh, focus to this year. That is that the Tent of Av is significant not just because it's not the ninth, not just because it's not Shabbos, but because the Tent of Av is in itself uh, independently, uh, actually massively uh, significant for us. Which brings us to a Gemara in Masachas Tainus Tav Chav So I want to explore, I want to explore why is today significant uh, independently of that it can't be yesterday or it could not have been yesterday. So if I may be so bold as to be Matriach, you to turn to the top of page six. Actually, the bottom of page five. So the Mishnah, the beginning, 
the first Mishnah way down in, first Mishnah in the, the fourth Paracontinus is a humongous Mishnah. I don't know if there's another Mishnah I'm, that's as big as this, as this Mishnah is. Huge Mishnah, and at the bottom of Chavav Ahmed Aleph, we come to Shivasa Betamaz and Tishabav. Uh, half, uh, halfway down the line, the bottom, next to the last line, the bottom of Chavav Ahmed Aleph, Chamisha Dvarmira Savoseno Be Shivasa Betamaz, Vachamisha Betishabav. So, this is a Mishnah that I have shared with you in the past. There are five uh, events that happen on Shavasa Betamos and five events that happen on Tishavav. Shavasa Betamos, next page, top of page, top of page six. Shavasa Betamos, Nishtabar Luchos. The Luchos were broken. Ubat al Hatamid, and the daily sacrifice was uh, discontinued. All of this requires explanation. Not for now. Vuf Goyer, and the city was breached. We're going to come back to this. City was breached. The most famous reason for Shavas is if you stop a kid on the street, why are we fasting on Shavas It's because the city was breached. That's the third of the five. Number four, the Sarf Apostomus says Hatora. And then number five is Vehemid, or Rashi's gear says Vehuamad Tzalambehechal. Okay. The Tishabav, what are the five things that happen on Tishabav? Nigzer al Avosenish al Aretz. The Xerah was, uh, the Miraglam came back, we'll see in a moment, and the Jews were uh, decreed that they would not go directly into Eretz Yisrael because of the pessimism that was expressed by the Jews in response to the report of the Miraglam. It was on Tisha B'Av, but Tisha B'Av, Nigzor Allah V'asena Sholiyach Nusul Aretz, V'chor Avabayz Barishono Bishmiya, number two and number three, the destructions of both Batei Mikdash, number four, V'nilka Dabetar, and number five, V'nech Rishohayir. The city was plowed up. So now let's go back to the Gemara on page two on the Avchav Tes Amid Aleph in Masachas Tainus. The Gemara here breaks down all uh, to the extent that they can, that it can, it breaks down the 10 events. The Gemara tries to, to drill in a little bit further on, on what are these 10 events. And now we're coming to uh, Tisha B'av. We'll come back to Hufka Ha'ir uh, in a little while. Now we come to Tisha B'av. So the first thing is the second line on page two in the Gemara and Chav Tesemet Aleph. The Tisha B'av nigzer al avosena sholu yech nesu la'aretz. Frek di Gemara minola and how do you know? I mean, it's very nice. The Mishnah says it. But uh, we want to try to understand where this comes from. What's the basis? And there's a long arichas in the Gemara. There's a long arichas in the Gemara until we come to the... Uh, line and a half before the lines get wide, Uchsev, and this is the famous Pasuk that's cited in this context, Uchsev Vatisa Kol Ha'eda, in response to the report of the Miraglam, Vatisa Kol Ha'eda, Vayitnu Es Kolam, Vayifku Ha'am Balayla Ha'hu, Vayifku Ha'am Balayla Ha'hu, it was that night when the people cried, they raised their voice and they cried, Amar Rabbah, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, just file away Amar Rabbi Yochanan. And now there's a whole Girsa problem in the Gemara. Our text is Oso Hayom Erev Tishabav Hoya. If you look on the side, Oso Laila Leil Tishabav Hoya. What's the Laila Hahu? The Laila Hu is the night of Tishabav. They started to cry. Amar Lema Kodesh Baruchu. You cried for no reason. You should have had faith. Why did you give in to the pessimism that was engendered by the report of the Baraglam? You cried for no reason. It was an unjustified cry. I'm going to make you. I'm going to, I'll give you a reason. I'll give you a reason to cry. So for my whole life, Mamish, until this year, so I thought that uh, it was Tisha B'Av, right? When did the Miraglam come back? According to this. And that's the whole middle section here that I uh, passed over. When did the Miraglam come back? When did they del- what day did the Miraglam deliver the report? They delivered the report on the 8th of Av. They hear the report on the 8th of Av. Severt Nebuch Finster in the Eugen. They get very upset. So that night, they're all crying. What was that night, Tisha B'Av? So... 
look at Tysus just for a second. I want to draw your attention to Tysus, something that I somehow registered in my brain this year for the first time. Tysus, Dibra Maschal Amar Abaya. And in order to understand the fullness of this Tysus, we'd have to work through the whole Gemara, but not for now. Uh, just look at the end of Tysus, Dibra Maschal Amar Abaya. Ubiyom Tishabov, Shavu Hamaraglim, Mitur Haaretz. When did the Miraglim come back? And that's the whole Cheshben of the Gemara. The Gemara tries to figure out all the 40 days, the whole Cheshben, when he sent them out, how long they stayed, where they went, when they came back. So Lashitas Taisvis, they came back on Tisha B'av. They came back on Tisha B'av. So when did they cry? If the Pasuk says, Vatisa kol ha'eda, vayitno es kolam, vayifku ha'am, balai lo ha'hu, they cried, not on Tisha B'av. They cried the night of the tenth of Av. Like, like this year was like a light bulb. Like it's unbelievable. So what's the girsa lechaora? The girsa of the Gemara according to Tosfos. Amar Rabba, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Also Hayom Tisha B'av Haya. Also Hayom Tisha B'av Haya. The day that they came back was Tisha B'av, and the next night they cried, which means they cried on the tenth. So why is Tisha B'av Tisha B'av? If they cried on the tenth, must be lefishitas taisvus that the gzera was already in place after the report of the miraglam that a kaddish baruch Hu knew that this report is going to generate an inappropriate response. The report itself was inappropriate. It's not just that Klad Yisrael was inappropriate in responding to the report of the miraglam. Vosep is the miraglam, what they couldn't see it the way Yoshua and Kalev saw it. But that, that they had to come and give a negative report that already, that already is a problem. So Tishabov is Tishabov, but Zolnish Menin, we shouldn't think that they came back like I thought Mamish for my whole life. On the eighth of Av, in fact, according to Tysus, it's a Rishonim. According to Tysus, they came back on the ninth, which means that the night that they cried was the night afterwards. We'll come back to this. So that takes care of the first of the five events in the Mishnah, the story of the Miraglan. And there's, there's more to think about, and I invite you to, to think about this. Like, what, what are the implications of this? It, it somehow <coughs> challenges what I had always assumed was a simple explanation of the unfolding of these events. Now it's a little bit more complicated. Now let's go to the second event. Frek de Gemara. Zok de Gemara, at the end of the second wide line, Chorav Habay is Borishona Minolan. So the Bach says Minolan. Same question, right? The second, the second of the five events mentioned in the Mishnah is that the first Beis Hamikdash was destroyed. How do you know? So the Gemara makes a whole chesh. The Chsev Ubachodesh Hamishi, the Pasuk says in Malachim, on the fifth month, the month of Av, Beshiva. La Chodesh, on the seventh of Av, he shnas chayas rei shono lemelech nevuchadnetzar melech bavel. This is the 19th year of the reign of nevuchadnetzar. Bo nevuzaradon, Rav Tabochim, his chief uh, executioner, came nevuzaradon, eved melech bavel Yerushalayim, v'yisrof es beis Hashem. Pazit says, b'ferish molochem beis, that v'yisrof es beis Hashem happened on the seventh of the month of Av. Uchsiv, but we have a problem because there's another pasuk in Yirmiya. Uchsiv u'bachodesh hachamishi be'osor lachodesh he shnas chas reishano lemelech nevuchad netzar melech bavel ba nevuzaradon rav tabachim amad lefnei melech bavel birushalayim vayisrofes beis hashem. So we have a steer and psukim. First pasuk says it was on the seventh. Second pasuk it says on the tenth. We actually have two problems. One problem is we have a steer and psukim. And for our purposes, we have a massive problem because neither of them says it happened on the 9th. So we're trying to figure out, Vosep is angefallen on the 9th. And for the Gemara, Vitanyo Yev Shalom Rabbi Shiva, Sharek Vanem Rabbi Osar. Vyev Shalom Rabbi Osar, Sharek Vanem Rabbi Shiva. Can't say it was the 7th, what do you do with the other Pussy? Can't say it was the 10th, what do you do with the other Pussy? Oh, I'll tell you what happened. Okay, Tzad. Uh, 
uh, they, they entered into the precincts of the Beis HaMikdash on the 7th. Just stop for a second and think about it. When was the city breached? When was the city breached? We just learned that a mission was breached on the 17th of Tammuz. So you've all been to Yerushalayim, you've all been to the Eratika. It's actually mind boggling. Because when we talk about the breach of the city, we're not talking about you walk into Shar Yafo. That's not the Choma that we're talking about. And we're not talking about the Choma uh, that you see from the uh, Mirpeset of the King David Hotel in uh, Hartzion. And that's not the Choma if you are so, I don't know, fill in the word to go to Shar Shechem. That's not the, that's not the, the Choma. We're talking about there's, a, there's, a, there's an inner Choma. If there's a, you can go somewhere around the Cardo in the old city, you'll see a psashtikala, a little, uh, little kaisel from the, from, the, from the Choma. How long is that kaisel to the kaisel? How long, how long is it to walk? You walk around the corner and you walk through the little uh, open area and then you go around and you go down the steps. How long does it take you to get from this Choma to the kaisel? It takes you, I don't know if you're... If it's hot and you have to drink water on the way, you'll stop to drink water. It'll take four minutes. It'll take six minutes. How, how long does it take? And what happened was they breached the city. They breached the wall on the 17th, and they didn't get to Harabayas until the 7th of Av. That's a, lot, that's, a, that's a lot of days to cover virtually an infinitesimal piece of real estate. We'll come back to that. It's amazing, think about it. Next time you go to Yerushalayim, you know, do the walk. Go to that spot, do the walk. So maybe I'm exaggerating. So it's five and a half minutes. It's five and a half minutes. Seven minutes. It took almost three weeks for the army that breached the wall to get to Harabais. That can only be speak a huge a huge fight. That means that the Jews on the inside didn't let them go. They maintained their struggle for almost three weeks to walk five minutes. So when you're there, think about what was going on in that spot. The, the valiant defense efforts on the part of the Jewish people to uh, not allow the Beis HaMikdash to be destroyed. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat for three weeks, almost. So, Dr. Gemara, how am I going to resolve the contradiction in the Psukim, A and B? How am I going to come to a conclusion that it happened on the 9th? So the Gemara says, here's what happened. And they ruined, and they ate, they ruined, they destroyed on Harabayas, Shvi'i, the rest of the seventh of Av, Shmini, the whole of the eighth of Av, Uchi, Samach Lecha and on the ninth, uh, close to dark, that is like tonight, uh, not tonight, I mean, tonight's not Tishabav, but on Tishabav, late in the afternoon of Tishabav, Itzisubo Es Ha'or, that's when they first set fire to the base Hamikdash, and again, it's like amazing. They're already on Harabayas, and it took them two days till they were able to, to light the fire to burn it. And it remained burning. Now we're beginning to get to where I want to get to now. It remained burning a whole day of the 10th. It remained burning. When did the Beis HaMikdash burn? So it burned first for an hour, I don't know, an hour and a half. 45 minutes on Tisha B'Av. And it burned, Kolayom Kulo, it burned today, burned on the 10th, quotes a Pasik. Now comes again Rabbi Yechanan, Vahainu Dama Rabbi Yechanan, Ilmale Hayisi Beoso Hador. If I were living then, Lo Kavate Veloba Asiri, I would have established Tishabav on the 10th of Av, Mipnesha Rubo Shal Hechal Bo Nisraf. 80%, 85%, I don't know, put in whatever number you want, overwhelming percent of the Beis HaMikdash was burnt on the 10th, not on the 9th. Only a few minutes, a few hours, a little bit of time, 
So, Frank the Gemara, so why do we do it on Tisha B'Av? V'Rabbanon, Aschalta, De Puranusa Adifa. We prefer to go after the beginning. So it is to these two lines that I want to devote the remainder of this uh, opening presentation. The machlek is between the Rabbanon and Rabbi Yochanan. According to Rabbi Yochanan, if you ask me what is the significance of the tenth, the tenth has its own independent significance. It's not a din, it's a nidche, we couldn't do a Shabbos, so we're doing it, can't do it on the ninth, we're doing it on the tenth. So then, lumdis chakira, so is it a Me'ikra din the ninth, but I can't, or is it Me'ikra din really now the tenth? It's not, it's nothing to do with, with the ninth. The tenth stands on its own as an independent day of sadness because the Gemara says, Beferish, Vahaya holech vedole kol hayom kulo. And Rabbi Yochanan concludes that in fact, as a result, given that, that's when we should have established the fast day. However, we disagree because of a very interesting principle that I want to examine in greater depth. Aschalta de Puranusa Adif. We go when it began. Even if it, it, it burned 45 minutes on Tisha B'Av late in the afternoon, Shkia time, that's enough for me. It started then, that's when I'm going to do it. Now, the sheet of Rabbi Yechanan, even though we don't paskan like Rabbi Yochanan, has implications in halacha that we do paskan like. Turn to the top of page three. So the Mechaber paskins in Simen Tovkov Nun Ches. I want to now operate with Rabbi Yochanan's shita. Even though we don't paskan like Rabbi Yochanan's shita, but it has, um, it has shadows. It has shadows in many different ways that I want to elaborate because Today, in fact, is the, the tenth of, uh, of Av. Paskins the Mechaber, Simen Tovkov Nun Chesif Alef, top of page three, Betisha Bav Le'ez Erev, Itzisu Eish Beheichol, Venisraf Ad Shkias Hachama Biyom Asiri. So it's an interesting Mechaber, it's a historical Mechaber. He tells you the historically that it was first set to fire Le'ez Erev, the Lashon of the Gemara is Samoch L'chashecha. The Lashon in the Mechaber is La'es Erev. Venisraf, the Lashon of the Gemara is Kol Hayom Kulo. But the Mechaber has an end time. He says it was until Shki of the tenth. <coughs> and as a result, we're not going to fast on the tenth. We paskin that we fast on the ninth, but nevertheless. Min kosher. Shelo lechol basar, v'shelo lishdos yayin belel asiri v'yom asiri. And we have this halacha that on a normal tish above, so uh, we extend the uh, iser of uh, basar v'yayin after tish above, the night after tish above, the night of the tenth, and the mechaber says the whole day of the tenth. We're not fasting, but there's a pesashtikel zecher. There's a shtikala continuation of yesterday's nihuge avelus and fasting and tainus, because after all, we're paying respects to the fact that today, namely the 10th, is also a day of independent significance. So the Ramah disagrees. Okay, you don't have to go till the you don't have to go till the end of the day, but you can do till chatzos. So both the Mechaber and the Ramah agree that we honor, we honor the independent significance of the tenth by extending the Isser of Basar V'yayin. Now, this year again for the first time, so I'm already like a shtickle old man, and it's shocking to me, it's actually deliciously wonderful that I could look at something that I saw a hundred times, and then, like, like something I never saw, like that Taisvis about, Taisvis Shita is that the Meraglam came back on the ninth, it's like amazing. And this year the word kosher struck me and I didn't have time to elaborate on it, to, to work on it. What does it mean a minhag kosher? And I'm just curious and I'm just throwing this out and I regret that I didn't have a chance to do the work. How many times does the, the Mechaber, the Ramah say minhag kosher? It's an, it seems to me to be minhag tov, minhag yofe, minhag, minhag kosher. I just, 
the phrase min kosher started to percolate a little bit and uh, I need to go back uh, home and to try to figure that out. But whatever it means, it's not like it's minhag. I mean, a minhag is uh, very important. We shouldn't trivialize minhagim at all. Minhag kosher, does that mean it's stronger than if it would have just said minhag? Does it mean it's less strong than if it would have just said minhag? I don't know. Al Kapanam, we see that Rabbi Yochanan has implications lahalacha, even though we don't paskin mi'ikar adin like Rabbi Yochanan. Another, another example is from the Yerushalmi and Tainus. The Yerushalmi quotes, uh, lists a number of people who actually fasted, who mamish actually fasted on both days. Says the Yerushalmi, uh, fourth line, bedin haya, sheyehu misanin ba'asiri, shebo nisraf beis alokenu, Vilama bichi, we really make her a din, we should have fasted on the 10th. So why do we fast on the 9th? Shabo is chila puranus. Betani kain, bishvi nichnasul socho, bishmini hoyu mekarkarin, bo mekarkarin means carrying on, shouting, screaming. And then bichi, he tsisu bo es haor, uba asiri nisraf. Says Yushami, Rabbi Shub and Levi tsiyem, chi eva asiri. Rabbi Avon Tsiyem, Chi'i Ve'asiri. Rabbi Levi Tsiyem, Chi'i Ve'lele Asiri. You see here there's a, a list, albeit a short list, of wonderful and great Jews who actually, in uh, recognition of the double days, the significance of both the ninth and the 10th, actually did fast. So we can't be geyser exera on Klal Yisrael, we should fast two days in a row. It's, it's just uh, not going to happen. But these great Jews somehow were on a, such a high madrega that they, Lemais, actually fasted. They fasted like the Rabbanan, and they fasted also like Rabbi Yechon. There's another, another shadow of Rabbi Yochanan that is uh, significant that I want to bring to your attention. And now at the bottom half of page three. So going back to the Gemara Masachas Megillah in a different sugi entirely, the Gemara at the bottom of Hayam et Aleph in Masachas Megillah at the top of Hayam et Beis talks about, mentions three strange practices that Rebbe instituted. Rebbe did three uh, behaviors. He acted three different times in ways that aroused eyebrow raising, like, like what, what's, he, what's going on? And one of them is, uh, the second line on Daf Hei Beis, Ubikesh la kor tishabov. Shangenek, Ubikesh la kor tishabov. This is a quite uh, eyebrow raising. We want to get rid of tishabov. Velo hodulo, and in none of them did the rabbis agree with him. He wanted to institute three different things. And the rabbis didn't agree with him. And the last one is he wanted to dispense with the observance of Tisha. A very strange Gemara. Arma Lefanov, Rabbi Abba Bar Zavda. This is quoted in the name of Rabbi Lazar Rabbi Chanina. So Rabbi Abba Bar Zavda says, Rabbi lo kachoya So that's not really what Rabbi was going to do. Rabbi didn't want to totally uproot Tisha. What are you talking about? It's inconceivable. Ella Tisha B'av shechal lios b'shabes hava. It wasn't a uh, regular year. It was a year like this year that Tisha B'Av fell yesterday. V'dachinhu le'achar ha-Shabbos. And it was a nitche. V'amar Rebbe, ho'el v'nitche yitche. It's only a nitche. All right. It's only a nitche. So you know what? We'll take a pass. He didn't want to get rid of total Tisha B'Av. He wanted to get rid of Tisha B'Av when Tisha B'Av is a nitche. V'lo hodu chacham. So that also requires significant uh, explanation. We'd be home free today, according to Rebbe. It's an idcha, it's all right. It's obviously v'lohodu lo chachamim, but what was Rebbe's cheshben? Just because it's an idcha, so loses its significance. Tosus dibra maschal ubikesh lakor tishabov v'lohodu lo. Tosus is operating with the havamin of the Gemara. The havamin of the Gemara is that actually wanted to dispense with tishabov entirely. L'chayre, that's Pshat in the Gemara. And that's why Rabbi Abba Barzavda had to jump in and say, 
stop. No, no, he didn't want to get rid of the whole. It can't be. It was under the, 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 that's when he felt that maybe we could uh, do away with it. Even that requires an explanation, but it's not like he mamish wanted to get rid of Tisha B'Av. But the Avamina was he wanted to get rid of Tisha B'Av. Kosha Frank Tosvis. Hechi Salka Daitach, the high Tana, the Rebbe Hoya wrote to Lakar Tisha B'Av Legamre. Right, the original assumption before we were corrected by Rav, uh, by Rav Abba Bar Zavda was that he wanted to shangenik with Tisha B'Av. How could it be? Legamre? For Armina, the Gemara says in Tainus, Kaloichel Veshose Betisha B'Av. Eno roe bin a chama shall you shall lie? What do you mean you wanted to get rid of Tishabov? The Gemara says if you act inappropriately on Tishabov, then uh, you're doomed. You'll never be Zoche to see the Nachama of Yerushalayim. A second of all, the old, the ha ain't best in Yocho Levatl Divre Bezen Chavero. Elam can godl heimenu bechachmo beminya. It's a very important principle. This is actually a very uh, relevant principle that uh, certain things are put in place and then that's it and then you can't come and change it you have to be greater than the people who put it in place you understand very well the contemporary complexity of this uh, principle when it comes to wanting to effect various changes in the community so do we have a right to affect can we affect and so on but the basic principle is and it certainly is a principle that has to be worked with and dealt with, ain bezden yochel divrei bezden chaveru elam kein gadol mimenu v'chachmo bevinyan. So what do you mean? We already had an institution of tishabav. When Rebbe says, "I wanted to shengenik with tishabav," what do you mean? Yeah, I wanted to get rid of tishabav. You, you have no right to get rid. You're one. You're one. Even if you're on the madrig of chachma, but not beminyan. The eshlama dolaratzel laakro. The first answer is, based on the Gemara that I mentioned to you earlier, that Tisha B'Av has chumris that the other fast days don't have. The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, Daf Ches, because of Huchbalu, because it's doubled. So that's why the Mishnah singles it out in Rosh Hashanah as the fast day for which the Shaluchim, the messengers, were sent out. And that's why it's not optional, it's required. So that's what Rebbe wanted to uh, get a dispense with. He wanted to make Tisha B'av like the other fast days. So, the Chamisha Inuyim on Tisha B'av, we start the night before on Tisha B'av. The other fast days start during the day, and we don't have Chamisha Inuyim, it's just a Chilu Shasiya. So, that's what Rebbe, when Rebbe, BK Shlak, or the Havamina wasn't Chas Vesholem, the whole thing, the Havamina was that he wanted to make it on par with the other fast days. First answer of Tisus. Second answer of Tisus is the one that interests me now. So what did Rebbe want to do? He didn't want to dispense entirely with Tisha B'av, but he wanted to move it. He woke up one day and he decided, oh, Rebbe Yochanan is right. Rebbe Yochanan is right. So we see here yet another example of the... Um, the, the afterlife of Rabbi Yechanan's opinion. And Rebbe wanted a Paschal like Rabbi Yechanan according to this Tysus. Top of page, uh, top of page four. I'll give you another example where this comes up. I have a student, I had a student in Yeshiva College by the name of Usher Becker, who drew my attention to this Shail uh, Suchuvis Bitzel HaChochma. It was written by Rabbi Tzal Stern. Rabbi Tzal Stern was a rabbi in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, Chelek Aleph, Simon Lamed Aleph, is dealing with a very complicated uh, international dateline shaila. So you understand that the issue of the international dateline has many uh, implications. What day, when is Shabbos, when is Yom Kippur, and when is Tisha B'Av? If you cross over the international dateline, so it's one day this way, it's the other way this way. So what do you do? And he's a rabbi in Melbourne, Australia, so it's a, it's a relevant uh, question. So the shaila was, if you have the option to fast on Tisha B'Av, suffix ches, suffix tes, or suffix tes, suffix yud. 
So each day, you don't know whether it's, the, it's really the eighth day or the ninth day. Or you don't know the next day whether it's really the, the, the ninth day or two days later or the day before, the ninth day or the tenth day. Every day is a suffix because of the crossing of the international day line. So Rabbi Tzalel Stern quotes Chassam Seifer, who paskins that if you have a choice to fast either on suffix Ches, suffix Tes, or suffix Tes, suffix Yud, you should fast on suffix Tes, suffix Yud. Why? Because at least you have Rabbi Yechanan. If you fast suffix Ches, suffix Tes, and it's Ches, so it's garnish my garnish. You didn't, you didn't accomplish anything. Ches is nothing in terms of the Nihuge Avelus and the fasting. So if it's Tes, if it's Taka Tes, you're good to go, you're okay. But Suffolk Ches, you haven't done anything. However, if it's Suffolk Tes, Suffolk Yud, so either way, you've done something. Either way, there's a Kium of something. If it's Tes, your mom is okay. If it's Yud, you, at least you have, you have uh, Rab, uh, Rab Yochanan. I'll give you another example. I'll give you another example. The Marsha asks on Rabbi Yochanan, the middle of page four. The Marsha asks on Rabbi Yochanan, and that's why I alerted you uh, earlier to note something when I read the Gemara, because I had in mind this Marsha. Go back to the Gemara that we saw in Chav Tesem at Allah for a minute. On page, on page two. So when it came to the Miraglim, when it came to the Miraglim, so Miraglim was the first of the five events that happened on uh, Tisha B'Av. Nigzeru ala vuseinu shalo yachnesu la'aretz. Uchsev, I'm going to reread what I read uh, a little while ago, the second to the last narrow line. Simple girsa also laylo leil tish above hoya. Amr la makadish borcha tembechis and bechir shalchinam. So when was HaKadosh Baruch Hu Koveya Bechia Lodoros? On the ninth. That's why we fast on the ninth. That's the first of the five events that happened on the ninth. Who's the Bala Memra that HaKadosh Baruch Hu established? The Bechia Lodoros on the ninth. Who's the Bala Memra? Rabbi Yochanan. Frek Marsha. How could Rabbi Yochanan say, if I was around then, I would establish it on the 10th. You'll forgive me, you yourself just said that God established it on the 9th. It's an Eisen Akasha. I never saw this, Marsha, till this year. It's an Eisen Akasha. Amar Rabba, Amar Rab Yochanan. Ani koveya lochem bechio ledoros. You said, it's your shita. You're the owner of this interpretation, that God established it on the ninth. If I would have been there, I would have moved it to the tenth. What are you talking about? As I frek the marsha in the middle of page four, frek the marsha, yesh ladatek bozet. The ha'iu gufa ka'amer la'el, the miyom bias meraglim betishabov nikva bo bayom bechiel ladoros. It's a very good question. I sat with the question for a while and I was stymied with this question. Then the Marsha gives an answer and you'll decide if you're satisfied that the answer is strong enough to uh, address the, what I think is a significant question. What did I tell you earlier? Earlier I drew your attention to Taisvis. What does Taisvis say? When did the Miraglim come back? They came back on the 9th. When did they cry? They cried on the 10th. Lashita satais vesnicha de bias miraglam haya biyom tes boerev. Va acharkach belel yud hoisa bechia shenik va oz bechia ledoros. According to Taisus, Rabbi Yechanan's 
opinion. This is not on the ninth. Right? The Mishnah says it's on the ninth. But he says the story happened as it happened, and they cried on the tenth, and that would have been the day. So there's an out according to Taisa Sashita. I'm not so satisfied because it's sort of like a bracketed shita. It's like not a my whole life, I didn't even know about this sheet. It's a strain. So if you have to go there, I'm not satisfied. But the kasha is a nice and a kasha. Let's now, let's now go to... Let's now go to the middle of page five. <coughs> the next issue that I want to address is which Besamikdash is Rabbi Yochanan going on? How many uh, Batei Mikdash were destroyed? So there were two Batei Mikdash, that, Batei Mikdash that were destroyed. When were they destroyed? The first one was destroyed on the 9th. What does it mean it was destroyed on the 9th? It doesn't mean it was destroyed on the 9th in the simple interpretation of that word. It means that it was set fire to on the 9th in the afternoon and it burned the whole 10th. Which Beis HaMikdash is that talking about? When the Psukim, when the Gemara wants to figure out Chor of Abayz Barishona Minolon on Tisha B'Av. So all the Psukim clearly are talking about the first Beis HaMikdash. Ubishnia, and how do you know that the second Beis HaMikdash was also destroyed on Tisha B'Av? So the Gemara says... The Gemara continues on Dav Chav Tesem et Aleph. How do you know the second base of Mikdash was destroyed on Tisha B'Av? And this is an issue that I addressed in great length in previous years. Because it's a bad day, it's a bad day. So it's a bad day because the first base of Mikdash was destroyed. So it's imprinted as a bad day. So bad things happen on bad days, so the second Beis HaMikdash was also destroyed. There is no independent evidence that the second Beis HaMikdash was destroyed on the 9th of Av, but it's a bad day. It's a bad day. Now, are you trying to tell me then that there's a difference between the first Beis HaMikdash and the second Beis HaMikdash? That the first Beis HaMikdash was set to fire the 9th in the afternoon and it burnt the whole day of the 10th. That's the Psukim, the Psukim talking about the destruction of the first base of Mikdash. And Rabbi Yechonen says, I would have done it on the 10th. Well, what about the second base of Mikdash? Was it the same thing? Megalgal in Chovel Yom Chayev, does that mean that the scenario is identical? That in the second base of Mikdash also, they set fire to it in the 9th in the afternoon and it burned the whole day of the 10th, or? in the second Beis HaMikdash, it actually burnt on the ninth. We have no evidence. We have no evidence. When Rabbi Yochanan says, if I would have lived then, I would have established it on the 10th, what's the then? Is it in the first Beis HaMikdash, if I was living, I would have established it on the 10th? Which is L'cha'ora, what happened? I mean, that's the Psukim. Rabbi Yochanan follows the Psukim. We're talking about the first Beis HaMikdash. Or does it mean the second Beis HaMikdash? Because if it's the first Beis HaMikdash, what difference would it make? If I would have lived then, I would have done it on the 10th. So is that relevant to me? Does it matter to me? We're now after the Chorban of the second Beis HaMikdash. So where's Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan going? Because there's a difference between the first Beis HaMikdash and the second Beis HaMikdash. We know for sure that there is a difference when it comes to Shavasa Betamos. So Shavasa Betamos, what's, what's one of the things that we fast for in Shavasa Betamos? At the bottom of page 5, Chazara. Chabishet Varmir HaSavosena B'Shavasa Betamos, top of page 6. What's one of the five things that happen on Shavasa Betamos? Hufka Ha'ir, the third of the five, is the city was breached. The city was breached. 
wait a minute, the city was breached twice. The city was breached leading up to Churban Bayis Rishon, and the city was breached leading up to Churban Bayis Sheni. When is Hufka Ha'ir? When is Hufka Ha'ir? So the Gemara asks, in the middle of page six, in fact, it was not on the 17th. In the time of the first Beis HaMikdash, it was on the 9th of Tammuz. In fact, the Gemara Hufka Ha'ir Zayin have a fifth line from the top of the middle section. Tainis Chav Chav Samid Beis, Hufka Ha'ir Zayin have a V'oksiv b'chodesh ha-revi'i b'tisha l'chodesh v'yechaz ha-karov b'ir uksiv basrei v'tibaka ha-ir. How can you tell me in the Mishnah that the third of the five events that we commemorate on Shavasa B'tamuz is the city was breached? No, fair Shepasek that says that the city was breached on the ninth. And for the Gemara Marava, Lokashi Kambarishona Kambishniya. The Sanya, Barishona of Goyer Betisha Betamos, Vishniya Bishavasam. So we have a clear difference between the historical scenario of the first temple and the second temple. In the case of the first Beis Hamikdash, Hufka Yer was on the ninth. The case of the second Beis Hamikdash, Hufka Yer was on the seventeenth. Now, my earlier point has now been uh, manifestly strengthened. Now, how long did it take them to get from, from here to there? How long did it take them to walk six minutes? It didn't take them from the 17th of Tammuz, in the time of the first Beis HaMikdash, to the 7th of Av. It took them from the 9th of Tammuz. It took them a month. One month to walk five minutes. One month to walk five minutes. That's what the Gemara says. First base to make the ninth, second base to make the seventeenth. The Ritva and the Rishonim already wonder, so uh, what happened to the ninth? The ninth came and went this year, and uh, very nice. It was a beautiful day, it was nice. The ninth, uh, ninth, the sixth, the ninth, the twelfth. The ninth is meaningless for us. What are you talking about? What happened to that big day, the ninth? It should be a big red letter day on our calendar. The ninth, the ninth, the ninth was Hufka year for Bias Rishon. The Ritva already struggles. Rishonim already struggle. What happened? Why is the ninth <coughs> irrelevant to us? So he answers, V.A. Shlomar in the second column, fifth line from the top, V.A. Shlomar. The Kivin Shechazra Habikia Bechodesh Zeh Bishniya. Since the second time the city was breached was in this month, you can't not fast to commemorate the second one. We'll soon see in a minute. Why does the second one take priority over the first one? So fast both, that's hard to fast both. You can't do both because they're too close to one another and you're asking too much. Forget about those Amorah, I'm quoted in the Yushama, who fasted Mamish back to back. Leave that aside. It's not back to back. There's a week in between. This is the 9th and this is the 17th. It's still too hard. So you're not going to do both. So now I'm going to do one. If I'm going to do one, which one am I going to do? So I'm going to do the commemoration of fasting for the second one because it's Evel Chadash. It's the newer one. I today, in 2016, live more under the impact of the second Chorban than the first Chorban. After the first Chorban, there was a second bias. After the second Chorban, there is no second bias. Today, we live because of Chorban Bayis Sheni. That's the implication. So it's Evel Chadash, it's a newer Avelus, and it's therefore Chamer Lehutve. Look at the Mechabra at the top of page 7. In Hilchas Tishabov, Simen Tov Kuf Mem Tes. This is the beginning, the very beginning of Hilchas Tishabov. Lehisanos Dalet Ha'anesim. Chayovim Lehisanos Betishabov, Bishavos Betamuz, Begimel Betishrei, Basar Beteves, Mipnei Dvarim Haram She'iru Bahem. 
These are the four classic prophetic fast days. You notice Tainus Esther is in a whole separate category. It's not in the Pasuk, it's much later. Uh, it has a whole separate status. These are the four that are mentioned in the Pasuk in Zechariah. I mentioned it earlier. Tzom HaRavi, Tzom HaChamishi, Tzom HaShvi, Tzom HaShvi. Tzom HaShvi, Tzom HaAsiri. Seif Beis, Af Al Gav Tachsiv Bikra. Bechodesh HaRavi, Betish Ola Chodesh Ufka Ha'ir. Frekt, the Mechaber, the Ritvaz Kasha. Frekt, the Mechaber, the Kasha that a number of Rishonim ask, what happened to the ninth? Even though it's a fair Shepasik, the Gemara already asked the ninth. And the Gemara says, well, the ninth is the first Beis HaMikdash. So we should fast for the ninth. God bless you. God bless you again. Even though you talk a right, that the first base of Mikdash was breached, leading up to the destruction on the ninth of Tammuz. But Kivin Shabishniya Hufka Biyad Zayinbo, Tiknu Lusanos Biyad Zayinbo, Mipnum Mishum, the Khurban Bayas Shani Khamir Lan. Khurban Bayas Shani Khamir Lan. Why is it Khamir Lan? So we saw in the Ritva, Avel Chadash, because we're living under its impact. Zakta Magan Avram. So you have another option. You could have fasted on both. Top right, page 7. Very nice. Quotes the Ramban. The Ramban is in the Teres Adam. The Ramban has a whole book, a whole sefer he wrote on Avelus. There are three parts to the Teres Adam. The first two parts deal with what we call Avelos Chadosha, if somebody nebuch is an Avel. And the last part deals with what we call Avelos Yeshana. What we're engaged in today is Avelos Yeshana. It's an old Avelos, which is why we have such difficulty in trying to uh, identify with it. And in the case of Avelos Chadosha, Rachman Litzlan, you don't have to be taught how to mourn. Somebody loses a close relative, it's emotional. But because it's today not Avelos Chadasha, but it's Avelos Yeshana, so we need to be instructed. We need to try to push ourselves to get into the mood, to try to understand it. Something that Rabbi Salvechik said every year is that, that Avelos Yeshana is like Tfila. Uh, just like Tfila. What's the Iker of Tfila? I've said this in the past. The Iker of Tefillah is Avodah Shebelev. It's not just saying the words, but it's an experience. So the Iker of uh, Avelos Yeshana is not just sitting on the floor, not eating, She'elah Shalom, etc. But it's Avodah Shebelev. It's also Avodah Shebelev. And that's why we're trying to do this, because it's so difficult. So uh, the last part of the Torah Sa'adam deals with Avelos Yeshana, and the the Ramban in his Torah Adam asks, so why taka don't we fast on the 9th for Churban Bayis Rishon and on the 17th for Churban Bayis Sheni for Hufka Ha'ir? And the answer is because they I saw this here for the first time. The Aruch HaShulchan gives another explanation as to why we favor the Hufka Ha'ir for the second Beis HaMikdash, why we fast on the 17th and not on the 9th. And the second half of page 7, he quotes... He goes through all of the uh, four fast days, and he says about halfway down the line, beginning Hayamim, second half of page seven. The Afal Gaf the Bebayis Rishon Hufko Yerushalayim Betisha Betamos. Kedichsev the Melachim. He quotes the same pasuk that the Gemara quotes. We call Makom Lo Tiknum Bo Atainis Rak Bi Yudzayin. She Bishniya Hufko Bo Ha'ir. We only follow the second. The Etzleinu Chamir Lan Churban Bayisheni. Why is Churban Bayesheni more important? For Shivasa Betamuz, the Me'oz Nis Dal Dalnu, the Nis Pazarnu, La Arba Ruchos When did Golos, when was Golos precipitated? Nis Dal Dalnu means we've become weakened, we become impoverished. The Dal is a poor person. When did the impoverishment 
of the Jewish people that we currently experience begin? When did the Nispazarnu, when did the Golos, the Pizur of Golos begin? Churban Baishen. And therefore, it's not just it's the most recent, but the fact that it's the most recent is explained by or elaborated by the fact that it's from then on that we are placed into the current situation in which we now find ourselves. So according to the Bavli is the difference between the first bias and the second bias. And what I want to get to and invite you to keep in mind is, does that same thing apply when it comes to Tisha B'av? Is there a difference between the first bias and the second bias when it comes to Tisha B'av? The whole scenario that, that I read to you from the Gemara that explains how we ended up on Tisha B'av, it's really the seventh and it's really the tenth and it started on the seventh and it really ended on the tenth and somehow the burning first started on the ninth. Is that an expression of the first bias? It clearly is an expression of the first bias because those are the psukim. The question is, is it also an expression of the second bias or not? And I'm showing you that when it comes to Shavas Batamus, in fact, there is a difference. There is a significant difference. Is a, there's over a week difference according to the Bavli. The Yerushalmi, however, on page eight, has a different explanation. It's a remarkable Yerushalmi. The Yushalmi has a different answer. The Yushalmi asks the same question when it comes to Shavas Batamus, and the Yushalmi gives a different answer that really sheds light, a more conceptual light on what it is that we're doing. Vuhufko here, three lines from the bottom of the page, on page eight, quotes Yerushalmi. The Yushalmi says, Vuhufko Ayir, the Yushalmi goes on the same Mishnah. Vuhufko Ayir is the third of the five uh, tragic historical events that we commemorate on Shavas of the Thomas. Frank the Yerushalmi, the same question that the Bavli asked, Ksiv betisha lachodesh of Ka'ir, va'at amar hochein, Pasuk says beferish, it happened on the, on the ninth, and you say this, you say it happened on the 17th, Amar abtanchum barchani lo'i, kilkul cheshbonos yeshka. Kilkul Cheshbonos Yeshkan, which means that it really did happen on the 17th. It happened the first time also on the 17th. I, the Pasuk says it happened on the 9th. They were so fayushkit and fabilbled and fa mixed up, it was so caught up in the, the maelstrom and the intensity of the tragedy that they lost track of time. They were Makalkel Vacheshbin. Look at the Pnei Moshe on the left side. Ela Kilkul Cheshbonos Yeshkan. It's about a third, quarter, a third way up from the bottom in the Pnei Moshe, the parish of the Pnei Moshe on the Yerushalmi. Kilkul Cheshbonos Yeshkan. Vito'u Becheshbon Machmas Rov Hatsoros Shavra Aleyah. And they made a mistake. Rabbi Salavechik pointed out that um, when, you're, when you're caught up in something, you lose track of time. And we know this from our own experience. If Rahman al-Islam, somebody's sitting shiva. So you're like, you're just like, is it Tuesday today? Is it Wednesday? We're like, what? Where am I? I'm, where, where? You, it just merges. And when somebody is in a war, you sleep six minutes, you're fighting, you're sleeping, you're, you're just you're totally out of whack. So they, uh, they really uh, made a mistake. It really was on the 17th, the first time also. According to the Rishalmi, there's no difference between the first and the second base of Mithish. According to the Bavli, there's a big difference. According to the Rishalmi, there's no difference. Both of them happened on the 17th. Either Pusik says it happened on the 9th. Velo Rotsa continues the Pnei Moshe, HaKos of Lishanos, Mikamosha Hoyu Sevurim. And the Pasuk didn't want to change it because it's really quite striking. The Pasuk eternalizes, and the Pasuk is God's word. It's a divine text forever, for all eternity, a mistake. Because you read the Pasuk, the Pasuk says, Befer, it happened on the 9th. And they know it didn't happen on the 9th. It happened on the 17th. And the reason why the Pasuk says it happened on the 9th because the Pasuk didn't want to change it from what they thought. They thought it happened on the 9th. So the Pasuk says it happened on the 9th, even though it didn't happen on the, on the 9th. So what, what does that mean? What does that mean? It didn't want to change it. Take a look on the next page. 
Tesis in, uh, in Rosh Hashanah. The top of page nine. This is the sugya that I referred to earlier about how Tisha B'Av is different because Tisha B'Av is Huchbalu Botsaros. Says the Gemara, Kom Hashem Tzvako, second line, top of page nine. Tzom Horavii, Vitzom Achamishi. This is the Pasuk in Zechari that I keep on referring to. The fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth. Yihiyah, Mertz Hashem, that's the tefillah, that all of these fast days will turn Yihiyah, Lebeis Yud, L'sasem, L'simcha. Skip a couple of lines. The Sanya, Amar Reb Shimon, it's about halfway down in the section that's, uh, that's uh, printed on the top of page nine. Amar Reb Shimon, the line beginning, V'nech V'sha'ir. The Gemara learns Pshat. What is Tzom HaRavii? Zeh tes betamuz shabo hafkohir. You think Tzom HaRavii is shavasa betamuz? Yes, it's tamuz, because Ravii means tamuz. But it means the ninth of tamuz, because it's a fair shapasik. Shenemar, betisha lachodesh vayechazak harav ba'ir. Velo hoyo lohem Second Taisus, Rosh Hashanah, Yud Chosamid Days, Hanu Beri Shona. When was Hufka here on the ninth? Says Taisus, only for the first time. Avol Bishneya Hufka be Yud Zayin. Umishumachi Avdinam be Yud Zayin Tainus. Vahach Brisa Masnis Matninan be Yerushalmi, Vigarsinan be Yud Zayin betamus. Taisus in Rosh Hashanah quotes the Yerushalmi, the Machlech is babbling Yerushalmi. If I were to ask you, so when was the city breached during the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash? You would have to answer me according to the Bavli. Well, it depends. In the destruction of the first Beis HaMikdash, it was breached on the 9th. and the destruction of the second Beis HaMikdash, it was breached on the 17th. If you were a bigger Lamdin, you would say it depends on a machlekes between the Bavli and the Yerushalmi. According to the Yerushalmi, what, what, according to the Bavli, what I just said pertains. According to the Yerushalmi, both of them happen on the 17th. And now, Taisus explains the Yerushalmi, V'ratza lomar, the mitoch terdosam ta'u becheshbonam, v'lo ratza haposek l'shano simikamosha hoyu sevurim. I believe that the Pnei Moshe, in his parish on the Yerushalmi, went to this Taisvis, lifted, lifted up this Taisvis, and that's the exact lotion of the Pnei Moshe. But the question is why? What's the significance of this? And for this we need the Korban Ha'eda. The Pnei Moshe quotes Taisvis, but leaves us a little bit wanting. Why? Why? You got to be kidding. So forever and ever and ever I should, I should institutionalize a mistake? I mean, this is God's book. It's Tanakh. It's a divine book. And it's a mistake. It's a terrible thing. Why? Why would God want us not to be corrected, at least for the historical record. I know then they got all Fayushkit, they thought it was the ninth, but we know it was the seventeenth. So why are you telling me it was the ninth? Loratza Kosov Lishanos, why? Zakta Karbanaida. All the way in the bottom right in the corner on page eight. Kilko Khajbanos Yeshka. This is a uh Yesidistika Karbanaida. Miro Vatsaros Toba Khajbonos, Vlo Ratza Hamikro Lishanos, Mimasha Samchuhaim. Now comes the explanation. Lomar, Kaviyachu, Anochi, Imo, Bitsara. That God wanted to demonstrate that as it were, he was also famished and fayushkit and fabilbuld. That he also could have sort of lost track of time. What do you mean God lost track of time? What, it's sacrilegious. But he wants to empathize with us. Imo, Anochi, Bitsara. So therefore, God kept a mistake because, as it were, God also made the mistake. So now you're talking. Now, now this is a very important principle. And in past years, I spent a lot of time 
analyzing the principle from many different contexts comes up in the kinos uh, more than once and uh, throughout rabbinic literature, the notion of imo anochi b'tzara, the notion of im, God goes into Golas when B'nai Yisrael go into Golas. God has to uh, remove himself from the Beis HaMikdash in order for the Beis HaMikdash to be destroyed. God empathizes with us. God is sitting on the low seat right next to us. God is on the low seat. God is, God is, God is in pain, God is in mourning. And that's why God forever put the ninth, even though it was on the 17th. And this for us is a great source of, uh, of hope and of support. We're not in it alone. We're not in it alone. You know, we'll see when we get to learning some of the keynotes that the absolute key question of Tisha B'Av, the, if you boil it down, the fundamental core issue that we struggle with on Tisha B'Av is distance from God. Distance from God. That we used to have a place where God was present in our midst, and then God was Nistalka, we saw it earlier, and now we're distant from God. We don't see God, we don't feel God, we don't feel the imminence of God, we don't feel the place of God, not in our personal lives and not in our national lives. We, we struggle to grasp onto an awareness of the presence of God. That's the question. That's the key question of Tisha B'Av. Because the implication, as we saw earlier, of Churban Bayes Cheney, Churban Bayes Rishon, is not the loss of a building, and it's not even the loss of sacrifices. It is all of that. But at its core, it's the loss of the connection. It's the loss of the connection. And this is an issue that we understand very well. And today it's not an issue for us, but certainly in medieval and early, uh, early medieval times, it was an issue that the Christians raised against the Jews repeatedly. That the fact that God destroyed your temple means that God forsook you. You are no longer the chosen people and we are the true Israel, and you have, you have uh, given up, you have totally lost any status, because God is distant from you. God moved away from you. So earlier, that today, that is not an issue that we struggle with, the Christian argument. We struggle with it for ourselves. But this was, we shouldn't underestimate the power of this in rabbinic literature, and a lot of when the Chazal try to create a, a connection to God, it's not only for the reason that we understand it to be, which is obvious, but it's also a polemic to try to respond to all they've been hearing, Yom and Valila, from the world around them. And therefore, we have a notion of Imo and Ochi No, it's not true. It's not true that there's a distance. It's not true that God is gone somewhere in the Olam Yisrael Yonim, and he's having a great time, and he's oblivious to what it is that we're experiencing on the contrary, God is sitting right here. The notion of Ima Anochi B'tzara brings us a tremendous amount of Nechama. Ad Kedei Kach, Korben Ha'eda, Shevasa B'tamuz, Hufka Ha'ir, Korben Bayis Rishon, that God wrote down forever, it's on the ninth, even though it wasn't on the ninth. So we see that when it comes to Shevasa B'tamuz, there's a difference. So the question is, what about the first Beis HaMikdash and the second Beis HaMikdash with regard to Tisha B'Av? Is Tisha B'Av any different? I never really thought about this question until, until this year. The scenario laid out in the Gemara is clearly based on the Psuk and the first Beis HaMikdash. The Gemara, after concluding that scenario, says, Ubishniya minola and Megalgil and Chovali Yom Chayav. So, does that mean that lock, stock, and barrel, we pick up the same scenario and we plunk it down into the second Churban? Or not? Top left, page 10. So, there was once a Vailiyit. There was once a Vailiyit by the name of Rabbi Yaleh ben Usher Ginsburg. Rabbi Yaleh ben Usher Ginsburg was uh, 
a Litvish uh, Talmud Chacham, <coughs> lived in the 18th century. And he, uh, he learned in Lita, he was a Rav in Minsk, he was a Rav in Valozhin, he had a very famous Talmud, whose name was Reb Chaim of Valozhin, was the Talmud of Reb, uh, Reb Arya Leib. And then he ended up in Metz. And we know him, uh, regretfully not by name, we know him by the name of his Sfarim. So this Vailiit is the Mechaber of the Shagas His name was Rabari Leib. He's the Mechaber of the Gevuro Sari. More of us know him from the Shagas We have a propensity to mention, refer to uh, people by the name of their book. The Mechaber says. The Mishnah Brura says. Mechaber doesn't say anything. The Rabbi Yosef Karo says. The Mishnah Brura doesn't say. The Rabbi Yisrael Meir Akayin says. But we call people by the name of the book. We talk about the Shagas His name was Rabbi Yaleib Ginsburg. He came to Metz in 1765. He's a legendary figure. I'll tell you one story from the Shagas Comes to Metz in 1765, and there's a whole tumult about when the Yisei Akdamos on Shavuos morning. At which point in the service do we recite Akdamas? So what do we do? What do we do when we say Akdamas? When do we say Akdamas? So we call the Kayin, Ya'amayda Kayin, and before we start laning, and before the Kayin makes the bracha, we read Akdamas. Turns out that that's relatively recent. The old minhag was, like we do in the Haftorah. When do we say Yitziv Piskam in the Haftorah on the second day? We say Yitziv Piskam after we recite the first line, the first Pasuk in the Haftorah. And then you go into Yitziv Piskam and then you resume the Haftorah. That's what we used to do for Akdamas. The earliest reference, Akdamas is very old, it's 10th century. Rab Meir Shaliach Tzibur, before the First Crusade. Akdamas is ancient relatively ancient. Akdamas was always recited after the first uh, Pasuk. And then um, at some point somebody said it's not right. It's not right because we're being mafsik in the middle of Kriya Satora. Past Nisha, we should be mafsik in the middle of Kriya Satora. So already in the days of the Taz and others, which means we're now in the 17th century and even a little bit earlier, they moved Akdamas from after the first Pasuk in laning till before laning. And then it became a whole issue before the brach of the Kayan, after the brach of the Kayan, can't be after the brach of the Kayan, because once the Kayan makes a brach, you should start laning right away. Your vaita shouldn't be mafsik, so they moved it all the way back. You call the Kayan, the Kayan stands there, and you read Akdamas. Rabbi Yaleib comes to Metz. And in Metz, they were uh, reading Akdamos after the first Pasuk. Rabbi Yaleib says, you know, by now the consensus of halachic opinion is we should move Akdamos. So they said, Rabbi. Rabbi, for the last 700 years in Metz, we've been laning Akdamos after the first Pasuk. I mean, you're a wonderful Jew. You're a fine man. But, you know, the previous Rabbi let this happen, and the 87 previous rabbis let this happen. So that's the way it is, because it's written in the Pinkas of our Kihila. In the Pinkas of our Kihila, it's written that uh, you say Akdamos after the first brach. So the Shagasari said to them, you know what? Halavai Aseris Hadibris should be written in the Pinkas of your Kihila. Maybe you would take it seriously. That's what he said to them. It's a shar favort. If the Sarah said Dibras would it. Now, no, like Signa, like Sinna, you know. If it was written in the Pinka, if you take it, Mamish Yahurg Valyavar, you should have put that in. That was Rabaria Leib. He remained the rabbi in Metz for a number of years. He died in Metz. He's buried in Metz. If you go to Metz today, and you go to the old Beis Akvaris and Metz, regretfully there was a whole uh, reshuffling. 
and there's one big uh, kever that has like five or six names of Gedolim who lived in Metz. The Avodas Hagirshuni, Reb Gershon Ashkenazi who lived in Metz, Reb Yaakov Reisha, the Shvos Yaakov who lived in Metz. All of them were buried in Metz, but none of them have their own matzeva. It's like a bilbul. There's one big matzeva that has all of their names on it, including the Shagasari. Frek de Shagasari, a top left in his sefer called the Gvura Sari, Frek de Gvura Sari, also Arye, Shagas Arye, Gvuros Ari. He was a rabbi in Metz for 20 years, Eiskehalten. After that first exchange, the first Shavuos, he stuck it out and uh, he was very poor. The, the, we have a Mesorah that the Shagasari was so poor that he used to write on the walls of his little tzrif. He had no paper, he couldn't afford paper. And he used to write on scraps, he used to write on the wall. It's like hard to believe these uh, incredible, incredible Jews who were able to accomplish so much under difficult, personal difficult circumstances. Dr. Gvura Sari, top left, Vahainu the Amr of Yochanan, page 10, El Molea Yisi Beoso Ador Lo Kovate Veloba Siri Kosholi. Ho al Korcha Hoda Rab Yochanan de Ka Omar Kavatu Ba Asiri, a Hurban by his Shani Koi. The Olav Onu Misane must be it's going on the second base Hamikdosh, because that's what we fast, that's what it matters. The Ilu Hurbais Rishon, my Nafka Mina, my Dahava Hava. But yet, Ukra may Hurban by his Rishon Kamari. So what's Rab Yochanan going on? There's a long Gvura Sari. I only uh, brought you the first paragraph, and I'm just going to summarize. That basically, he says that Rabbi Yochanan is going on the first base Hamikdash, and it matters whether the first base Hamikdash would have been on the ninth or the tenth. That there is a Nafkamin even for the case of the first base Hamikdash, but when it comes to the second base Hamikdash, even Rabbi Yochanan is moda that it all happened on the ninth. So, in fact. The Gvur Sari is the only one, at least to the best of my knowledge now, that really makes this point, that there's a difference when it comes to the Churban of the Beis HaMikdash on Tisha B'av between the first and the second, just like there is a difference when it came to Hufka Ha'ir between the first and the second. Never occurred to me until this year. I always knew about Shivasa Betamos, whether it's the ninth or the seventeenth, Machlekes Bavli Yerushalmi, but I never thought about the destruction of the second Beis Hamikdash on Tisha B'av. Was the scenario the same as the first, or was it different than the first? And the consensus seems to be that it was different than the first, not as different as Hufka Ha'ir between the ninth and the seventeenth. But this whole Rabbi Yechanan is irrelevant when it comes to the second Beis HaMikdash, because kulam hoidu v'him lichu v'amru, then when it came to the second Beis HaMikdash, all of it happened on the ninth. And there was none of this only in the afternoon of the ninth, and then it lasted the whole tenth. It had really happened on the ninth. That raises the question, to go back to the beginning of the presentation, so if the second Beis HaMikdash all happened on the ninth, but yet the Mechaber Paskins, and we saw it earlier at the top of page two, that there are still Nihuge Avelos that persist into the tenth. That you understand, according to this uh, scenario, only goes back to the first Beis HaMikdash. By the second Beis HaMikdash, there'd be no rationale to extend the Isser of, uh, of Yayin and, and Basar to the tenth, because nothing happened on the tenth. So, fascinating discussion. Let's now go to page 13. I want to now draw our attention to our opinion. I want to now draw our attention to why do we not follow Rabbi Yechina. So what I have tried to convey to you so far is the significance of the tenth of Av. So the, the simple significance of the tenth of Av is that it's a nitche from the ninth of Av. However, I'm trying to make a case that it has its own independent significance because, according to at least the scenario 
described in the Gemara in the context of the first Beis HaMikdosh, today is when it happened. It happened on the 10th. At Kedekach, that Rabbi Yechenin said that I really would have done everything on the 10th. And we try to see some of the implications of, of Rabbi Yochanan, that we have to extend Avelos to the 10th. And we saw that according to Tosis, Rebbe, who was, wanted to be Ma'aker Tishabov on Megillah Hayam at Beis, didn't really mean to be Ma'aker Tishabov entirely, but it meant to do it like Rabbi Yochanan, to do it on the 10th. We saw the difference on Shiva the 10th, the 9th, the 17th. But now I want to leave that aside, and now I want to move into, for the last part of this presentation, why is it that in fact we don't follow Rabbi Yochanan, that we follow the Gemara's Lashon is Aschalta de Puranus Adifa. So for this we need a Gemara in Avedi Zara, page 13, Dafnun, Beis, Amid Beis. I just want to bring you a Pasuk that the Gemara quotes. The sugya here is going to take us too long to work through the internal sugya in Avedi Zara. But the Gemara quotes a Pasik from Yecheskel Perik Vav, Pasik Chav Beis. The, talk, the, 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 the issue here is what is the status of various Kleishares after destruction? What is the sanctity status after destruction? And the Gemara quotes a Pasik, the Chsiv, Uba Uba Pritzim Vechilaluha. Pritzim are. are uh, lawless people, wild people, uh, violent uh, people, profane people. They came and they, uh, they made profane, they profaned the, the Beis HaMikdash. Why is it that we hold Aschalta de Puranus Leaf? What's the rationale? I understand Rabbi Yochanan's rationale very well. Ruba shel heichel bo nisraf, so we should fast on the day that Ruba shel heichel bo nisraf. Aschalta de pura nusa. So what if it began? It actually was burning only for a very short period of time. If today is the commemoration of the destruction of the temple, so I should commemorate the day the temple was Rubo, Rubo de Rubo destroyed. Why aschalta de pura nusa? So the Chsam Sofer at the top of page 14 cites this Gemara in Avodah Zara. The Chsam Sofer says the reason why we go as Chalta de Puranusa is because once Bo Preetz in Vechilaluha, then the Beis Hamikdash lost its status. It's not holy anymore. Once the Preetz came, let's say the Babylonians, let's say the Romans, and lit fire to it, that moment, it became profaned. Once it's profaned, it's done. What burned the day of the 10th? A building burned. The Beis HaMikdash didn't burn. There was no Mikdash, there was no Kedusha. Once Bo'u Pritzim, it becomes Chulin. Once it becomes Chulin, it's not significant to use the terminology of another medrash that I've cited often in the past, it's simply Eitzim Va'avanim. It's just Eitzim Va'avanim. Nothing sanctified was destroyed on the 10th because its sanctity was gone the moment Ba'u Pritzim and set fire to it. That's the way the Chsam Seifer and also the Or Sameach, I don't want to read it inside, at the top of page 14, that's how they interpret the rationale, and I think there's a lot of wisdom to this rationale. At which point was the Beis HaMikdash really destroyed? It wasn't destroyed when it was burning, it was destroyed when it was set to fire, because once it was set to fire, that clicked off, that removed, that moment removed any level of sanctity to the Beis HaMikdash. Which brings me to a Mesha Chachma on the bottom right of page 14 that uh, I have shared in the past, I don't remember if I've shared it on, on Tisha B'Av. This is uh, one of my uh, all-time high go-to Meshachachmas. Meshachachma Rameyer Simcha of Dvinsk, who lived in Dvinsk, in Poland, in the first part of the 20th century. It's like postmodern for uh, 
biblical uh, commentators. He lives in the 20th century, the Meshachachma. And the Meshachachma asks a very powerful question. And this is also a very important principle for us that I'd like to uh, focus on. Meshachachma asks, how could Moshe Rabbeinu break the luchos? I don't remember if I said this before. If I did, I don't want to say it again because I'm trying to be, not repeat myself. I, I know I've taught it, but I don't know if I taught it on Tisha B'Av. But it's worth Chazar if I taught it once on Tisha B'Av. Or maybe you forgot it, so then I'm, I'm okay. So the Meshach Chachma asked the following question. How could Moshe Rabbeinu break the Luchos? How can he break the Luchos? The Torah refers to the Luchos as Michta Velokim. God wrote the Luchos. God just gave Moshe the Luchos. And the Medrash describes that God was holding on to one end of the luchos and Moshe is holding on to the other end of the luchos. God just gave it to you. And then God says, go down because there's trouble. You go down, you see them worshiping the golden calf. Where do you come off break smashing the luchos? God just gave it to you. God wrote it. It's God's text. It's God's thing. You broke the luchos. It's chutzpah. What you should have done, he doesn't say it in so many words. You should have gone down, you see them Nebuch doing terrible things. You give it a big hug and a kiss. You take off your talus. You wrap it in your talus. You put it down on the side of the mountain. You go down and you scream bloody murder at the Jews. Okay, I get it. I get it. They shouldn't get it. They don't deserve this. They don't deserve it. They're worshiping an idol. It's a terrible thing. It says in here, you can't worship an idol. And they're worshiping an idol. You can't give it to them. So don't give it to them. Don't give it to them. But smash it. And Nachtzad that see the last Rashi in Chumash, he gets a big kish and piskel. Yashikayach. Yashikayach sheshibarta. Big. Wow. wow. Credit. How do you smash the luchos? Frecht. The Meshachachma, it's an Eisen Akash. Don't give it to them, but don't destroy it. Don't mistreat it. Don't defile it. And for the Meshachachma, Va'al Tidamu, line number six. The line beginning by Midbar, bottom right, page 14. Va'al Tidamu, and you shouldn't even imagine. Ki amikdash v'hamishkan hema inyanim kedoshim ba'atzman. In my terminology, there are two kinds of sanctity. There is what I'm going to call intrinsic sanctity or inherent sanctity. And then there's what I'm going to call contingent sanctity. There are two kinds of sanctity. What does it mean something is holy? Is, it, is the holiness intrinsic to it, inherent in it? Or is the holiness of this object contingent? Yes, it's holy, but its holiness is contingent upon something external to it. Tzvei dinim in Kedusha. Is it intrinsic, inherent, or is it contingent? Zakta Meshachachma, there is no such thing as intrinsic or inherent sanctity. There is no such thing as anything that has inherent Kedusha in this object, no matter what. Va'al tedamu, don't even imagine. Ki amikdash v'hamishkan heima inyanim kedoshim be'atzmam. Don't even imagine that there is, even the Beis HaMikdash, the Mishkan, has inherent, it's be'etzem, that the etzem of the chefza is a chefza shel kedusha. Don't even think that way. Chalila. It's a very strong formulation. And God forbid... She even imagined such a thing. Hashem is Baruch Shara B'Soch Banav. God dwells among his people. V'imheim HaKadam Avru Bris. And if the Jewish people defile and violate God's covenant, Husa Mehem Kol Kedusha. There is no sanctity. V'imheim HaKechlichol. They are simply like a profane vessel. Here comes the Pasuk, cited in the Gemara in Avedi Zarah. Ba'u pritzim, vayichalalua. Pritzim come, done. You act like a parrot. You act like someone who's not in sync with the 
with the, uh, with the covenant of God, you're done. You become profane. In past years, we analyzed in great detail, it's one of the lines in the Kina, the Gemara Masechas Gitin, that Titus came in and did terrible things in the Kodesh Kadoshim and Garnish, nothing happened to him. Why? The Medrash says that last year, <coughs> a Zor would come in, even under the most holy circumstances, into this space. He would die. It's the Kodesh Kadoshim. And now Titus comes in and does whatever he does with impunity and nothing happens. Why? Because last year was holy, this year there's no holiness. He came in to a room, to a room that had walls, had stuff in it, nothing. It had no sanctity. Once Bo preats him, there's no Kedusha at all. Now to answer our question, you're right. The tablets that were given by God to Moses is God's, it's michta velakim, it's mamish, there's God's fingerprints all over it, literally. Gam heima, enam kedoshim be'etzem, rak bishvilchem. Even the tablets, the luchos that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to Moshe Rabbeinu has no inherent or intrinsic sanctity. The sanctity only become, comes because of you, because you have a connection to it, you have a relationship to it. And when the Jewish people behave inappropriately, they're considered like uh, broken shards of clay. When Moses broke the tablets, he didn't break anything holy. The Kedusha was already gone. When the Jews started worshiping the golden calf, the, this clump of clay turned into just a clump of clay. What did Moshe Rabbeinu break? He broke a clump of clay. Nothing. Just a clod of earth and no Kedusha at all. We understand that this needs further refinement because we know the famous Chazal that Shivrei Luchos Amunachim Ba'aro so according to the Meshachachma, why are Shivrei Luchos Munachabal? According to the Meshachachma, why can't I walk on all of the Harabayas today? Even those who walk on the Harabayas don't walk on all of the Harabayas. So that requires an explanation, and he actually, it's a long shtickle in the Meshachachma, and he deals with it. But I leave you, for now, with this Pusik that was quoted in the Gemara Navadi Zorah, that's relevant to the opinion of the Rabbanov of why Aschalta de Paranusa Adifa, because Bo Pritzim Vayechaluluha. Sanctity depends on us. And if you only think about this for the whole day, it was worth thinking about, and that is the existence of sanctity for us in our own lives depends on us. There's no guarantee, there's no automatic sanctity. You want sanctity, you have to make the sanctity. There's nothing objective about Kedusha. You want sanctity in a shul, in a Beis HaKnesses. You want the shul to be a Makom Kadosh. So you make it, you have to make it. You have to behave appropriately in shul. You want your home to be a sanctified space. It shouldn't just be a house where we live. It should be a Pesachtikal or something higher. We want to aspire to something greater. We want our kids to see something more in our houses than just the house. There's no guarantees. There's nothing automatic. We have to make it ourselves. Once the Beis HaMikdash is destroyed, Bo preats him. Once it's Yitzisu Bo Es Ha'or, Aschalta de Puranusa Adifa, because after that, it's done. After that, it's gone. After that, it's over. I want to conclude with, let's just go to page 18. I want to give you two more examples. I want to give you two more examples. One from modern times and one from pre-modern times. 
about uh, Aschalta de Pura Nusa. There's a long discussion, now's not the time. I also spent some time in past years dealing with the issue of Yom HaShoah. And we're going to get to it, but I'll say now, in the name of Rabbi Soloveitchik, who made a very strong point every year that uh, today is Yom HaShoah, that there is no Chav uh, Zayin Nissen, didn't mean anything to him, and they thought it had no basis. The day that uh, the Knesset, and by extension, so many of us and our shuls and our communities observe Yom HaShoah meant nothing to him that it's all on Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is the day that's uh, designated to commemorate not only what happened on Tisha B'Av, we saw before five things that Mishnah mentioned, and there are other things that happened on Tisha B'Av after the Mishnah, but it's a day set aside to commemorate all of Jewish tragedy, including the Shoah. And uh, yet, there was a discussion early on, on page 18, uh, when shortly after the State of Israel was founded as to whether there should be a Yom HaShoah, which was pretty much accepted. The question is, when should it be? When should there be a day to commemorate the Holocaust? And uh, the chairman of the subcommittee who was designated to address this issue by the name of Mordechai Nurak suggested it should be on Asar Beteves, which is on the left side of page 18, these are uh, minutes of a subcommittee of the Knesset that are found in the archives of the Knesset that I copied from the archives of the Knesset. And there's a whole question about when should the day be designated in <coughs> Israel in 1951 to commemorate the Holocaust. And he said Asar Beteves. And the question is why Asar Beteves? Um, before that, in 1947, the chief rabbinate of Israel, even before the founding of the state, established something that they called Yom HaKadish HaKlali on Asar Beteves. And there are many Jews, particularly in Israel, uh, but not only in Israel, who observe it, Ad HaYom HaZeh. There are Jews who are survivors of the Holocaust or Jews who are children of those who were killed who themselves survived the Holocaust, who don't know when their parents were killed or when their siblings were killed and when their spouses were killed or when their children were killed, they don't know. So in 1947, the chief rabbin had suggested you should observe Asar Beteves as Yom HaKadish HaKlali, so the general Kaddish day, that if you misupik when the yard site was, you misupik when the Yom HaMisa was, you don't know when you're gonna say, you wanna say Kaddish, you don't know when, you have no idea. So you should say it on Asar Beteves. By extension, Nurak, Rab, uh, Rabbi Nurak suggested that maybe the whole uh, commemoration of uh, the Holocaust Bichlal in Israel should be, not just to say Kaddish. And one of the reasons given, which is on the right side of page 18, is because uh, that's when it began. That's when it began. It began on Asar Beteves. Asar Beteves is the siege. What was the Shalshela Sadvarim? The Psukim in Tanakh. The siege happened in the ninth year on Asar Beteves, and then the 11th year came the breach, and then three weeks later, or a month later, depending, came the destruction. So it all began on Asar Beteves. It all began on Asar Beteves. Asar Beteves was the beginning. And if Asar Beteves is the beginning, so we should have Yom HaShoah on Asar Beteves, because we want to come full circle, because now, please God, hopefully this is the end. Their hope was, I would say even more than hope, their expectation was, but certainly their hope was, that the Shoah is, is the end of all the Tsaras. What can be more of a Tsara after the Shoah? And therefore, we're now closing the circle. We're so grim, et ha-ma'agal, it began on Asar Beteves, so we want to end it on Asar Beteves. So we see that Asar Beteves is the beginning, and the notion of beginning is significant. Aschalta de Puranusa gets a certain status. My last example comes from the Chmelnitsky massacres on page 19. I'll just summarize it for you. 
and that is as follows. The Chmelnitsky massacres started in June of 1648. And it went from 1648 through 1649. They're known, and I've talked about this more in the past, I don't want to repeat, it's known as Xeros Tach Vitat, Tav Ches is 1648, Tav Tes is 1649. And the beginning of 1650, there was a respite, and the people in charge of the communities that were affected, the East European communities, primarily Poland and surrounding areas that were affected by the Chmelnitsky massacres, wanted to do something to remember what happened. So obviously their first responsibility was to try to help. We don't know exactly how many people were killed in the Chmelnitsky massacres, somewhere around 300 communities. The numbers vary widely. Let's just say 50,000, but it's give and take. Some say it was many, many fewer than 50,000. Uh, some say it was many, many more than 50,000. So the first uh, item on the agenda is to try to fix, do whatever they can for Nebuch, for those who were able to survive. And then they wanted to do something to commemorate what happened, and they established a fast day. And they decided to fast, establish a fast day on the 20th of Sivan. And the reason why they decided to fit, establish a fast day on the 20th of Sivan is because it began on the 20th of Sivan. Uh, the text that you have on the right side of page 19 describe when the story happened. It happened on Wednesday, the 20th of Sivan. And on the bottom right of page uh, 19, later on in the same book, Yvain Mitsula, we're told that they established a fast day on the, tw the 20th of Sivan because Bo bayom shanasu harigos nemerav kayadua lakol shahisaki hilo rishona. We do it on the day it started. Reb Gavriel Bereb Yoshua, the Pesach Tshuva on the left hand side, also says we're going to do it on the 20th of Sivan. And he quotes six lines from the bottom Vehi ho atchalta de puranusa ubasar atchalta azlina. So here we have a 17th century echo of this rabbinic principle that when you have to do it, you should do it as chalta de puranusa. Some suggested that uh, Yom HaShoah should be Kristallnacht, the equivalent of Kristallnacht because that's when it began. Some suggested it should be the equivalent of September 1st, 1939 when Germany invaded Poland because that's when it began. The notion of the beginning is significant. If it lasts for a year and a half or it lasts for five years, so when are you going to commemorate it? Why my yom mi yom and why is one day more significant than another day? The answer is the first day. Yesterday there was nothing. Today is something. So today becomes significant. And that's the rationale for the Rabbanon who say when it comes to Chorben Bayes Rishon, the way the Gemara works through the steer and the psukim between the seventh and the tenth, that the uh, flame was set to the Beis Hamikdash in the afternoon, late in the afternoon, Samach Lachashecha of the ninth, that even though it burned today, a whole day today, and Rabbi Yechelen says we should taka, in fact, have done it today, but Verabanan Aschalta de Poranusa Adifa. You always go th for the beginning, and the beginning is because. The beginning is the only day when today is different than yesterday because after the beginning, today is the same as yesterday because it's every day for five years or for a year and a half. And I'm also adding, based on the Chsam Seifer and the Or Sameach, the notion of Bo Pritzim Vayechalaluha, that once the Pritzim come, then all bets are off, all Kedusha is gone. And that is this incredibly powerful Meshechachma that if you want sanctity, you have to have it yourself. So uh, what, what we've seen until now is the issue of the significance of today of the 10th, not just as a day of Nidche, but also a day that has its own uh, direct uh, relevance and significance uh, for us. We'll take a five-minute break, and then we're going to start the, uh, the study of the Kinos.